Hello everyone, my name's Nabila um, and I've come here today from the UK. Um, I'm here representing, there should be a logo there, I don't know where it's gone, but I'm representing the IPTG, which is the Interdisciplinary Peace Tech Group and it's supported by the University of Bristol, specifically the D Gene Golding Institute, which is a data science research institute. Um, and also I am a PhD student at the University of Bradford where I'm currently pursuing my doctoral studies in the Department of Peace Studies and International Development. Um, I feel really lucky to be here because I've been um, engaging with the work of Build Up for many years now from the fringes. Um, it's the first time I'm attending a conference. Um, back when I was doing my MA quite a few years ago at the University of Bradford, I did my final dissertation on online gaming and peace building. Um, and at the time it was a bit radical, certainly in my department, to say that I wanted to write a whole dissertation on gaming. Um, I'm glad I did it, but whilst I was doing research um, for that dissertation, that's when I came across Build Up. Um, and it was really exciting for me to see that Build Up was hosting this conference where all these um, innovative thinkers were coming together to discuss all things peace and tech. Um, so to be here today presenting my own work is pretty surreal. <laughs> So the IPTG is an international and interdisciplinary network of academics, practitioners and data scientists, all focused on the emerging field of peace tech. So the key word there being interdisciplinary, we all come from different walks of life, we have different skills, we have different um, focus, uh, focuses, but the idea is that we come together, we bring our skills together to try and um, nurture some curiosities, ask some questions, um, not necessarily come up with solutions, but certainly exchange ideas and put our skills together um, to design projects. Um, and so one of the commitments that we have is turning research into action. So all of us individually are involved in lots of research um, in lots of different areas. And the idea is that when we bring our skills together, hopefully we can translate that research into real action in the real world. So my research particularly is focused on borders. So everything that I've read on borders in the literature tells me that borders are relational spaces. They include actors, practices and imaginaries. So they're not necessarily like when we think of borders, we think of fixed realities. Um, borders are not always that. So to understand all of that, this necessitates, in my view, an engagement with the small stories that come from experiencing the border in day to day life. Um, and for me, I think that's especially important in the case of disputed territories and contested regions, where those realities are not so easily defined, where territorial units don't have those hard edges that we're used to seeing when we look at a map. And the case study that I'm focusing on for my research is that of Kashmir. And Kashmir is recognized as a disputed territory, a contested region. It only has blurred edges. There aren't any hard borders that define it. So to engage with small stories, I think requires um, an engagement with alternative methodologies. And this is where I think art comes in. Um, so as a researcher, as an academic, I look for theoretical frameworks um, to ground my, my work in. Um, and visual ethnography, I think, is one of those frameworks that captures this. So visual ethnography visual ethnographers tell us that we need visual ethnography because if social science researchers are to do research that has an impact in the real world that's interventional and communicates across disciplines and sectors, we need to be able to gain deep insights that get under the skin, you know, under the surface of what is visible to share our findings and to engage others in our arguments and in the stories of those people that participate in that research. So to use a visual methodology is really intentional on my part, especially in the context of Kashmir, which internationally is framed as a bilateral issue between India and Pakistan. So the Kashmiri narrative is very much missing from the discourse. So to engage with the Kashmiri narrative, we need alternative methodologies. And I define artistic inquiry as an alternative methodology. So the idea is to extract the Kashmiri narrative from the dominant narrative that at the moment is held by um, India and Pakistan who see it as a territorial dispute. Uh, Kashmiris might not necessarily see it that way. I'm a Kashmiri myself, I certainly don't see it that way. So it would be nice to hear, I think, and share the, the stories of Kashmiris living um, in that region. So my project, <laughs> commits to exploring life along uncertain borders visually, if I was to put it in a sentence. So I want to use art to tell stories or use art to get people to tell me stories, share their histories, imagine their futures 
and use the artwork produced to create an interactive map that's bursting with small stories. So I want to combine art with technology um, and I want to ground it in peace building theory, specifically decolonial theory, some feminist theory, peace building literature, because as an academic, I need to do that. But I think that using technology will help me to share my findings um, beyond the academy. That's something that researchers struggle with sometimes. Some of us might have heard that really depressing statistic that your PhD research or your PhD thesis will only be read by about four people and two of those will be your examiners. That's quite depressing. And this is something that's true of research that's produced um, generally. Not many people engage with written research beyond the academy. So if we're doing all this really important work, we need to think of ways of sharing that research. And I think technology um, enables us uh, well, it gives us the tools to be able to do that. So building technology into my research project is almost a commitment really to um, share what I find beyond um, my two supervisors. <laughs> um, so I was really lucky to be in a workshop yesterday where the people from Berghoff Foundation were talking about peace mapping and they use GIS software to uh, map peace initiatives. And that was super interesting for me because that's essentially um, what I'm trying to do and I'll explain how in just a moment. So let's have a look at a map. This is a map of the wider region of Kashmir. The history is so long, I can't really go into it here. But essentially, Kashmir, or the former princely state of Kashmir, as it was before 1947, um, is kind of in between uh, Pakistan and India. The region that I'm focusing my research on um, is Azad Kashmir, which is the territory that's administered by Pakistan. The larger portion is on the Indian side. Um, known as Indian Occupied Kashmir, Indian Administered Kashmir, whatever your political affiliation is, you can choose a language. Um, my own family are from the area of Azad Kashmir and my project focuses on that particular region. So this is what Azad Kashmir looks like. It's a narrow strip of land on the eastern side of the um, wider princely state of um, Azad Jammu and Kashmir, which no longer exists as an entire entity anymore. It's divided, it's split. Um, and Azad Kashmir, as I say, doesn't have any hard borders, but it is divided from the Indian side by a line of control, which is a military, or well, it's a militarized ceasefire line. So it's um, non-permeable, it's non-porous, you can't cross it. Um, it's heavily militarized. Anybody that lives in Azad Kashmir lives in close pro proximity to that line of control because it's a narrow strip of land. Um, and so my own family are from the regions of Mirpur, Gautli, and Bagh. And my research will be focused in Bagh. So what I'm asking people to do is to use drawing. So I've selected drawing as a research method. And I'm asking them to draw for me what their life looks like living in the borders in a state of uncertainty and in what sc some scholars have called suspended sovereignty. So what does life look like day to day living in the borderland region of Azad, um, Jammu and Kashmir? And then the idea is to take that artwork, place it onto an interactive map, um, so a digital layer on, on a map in a digital space. So the idea being that you can hover over that map and you can reveal the artwork that was produced in that particular space. Um, and for me, I think that's really cool <laughs> because it means that you can see where the artwork has been produced. You can also see what that person has drawn and if I have 500 pieces of artwork, I don't think I will, but if I have 500 pieces of artwork, um, there can be 500 different truths and 500 different stories and that's okay. Um, and that's the beauty of art, like it's a self-expression, it's a self-expressive um, uh, form. So this interactive map doesn't exist yet. I don't have the digital skills to produce it. It's one of the reasons why I'm here. I've had some amazing conversations with lots of people um, who are doing really amazing things in the world of tech. So whilst I don't define myself as a tech person, I'm not a data scientist, I'm not a practitioner, but I'm super, super curious about how I can use all of those ideas and skills and innovations to create a map like that, that will hopefully help me um, to share my research, not just beyond the academy, but beyond the space of Azad Jammu and Kashmir and to people around the world, that's the aspiration. And maybe next time I'm at Build Peace, I'll be able to show you that map. Thank you.